Don't worry about that. Don't worry about me setting anything or anyone on fire this time. You may be happy to know. I'm going to read to you from the scriptures. I'm going to read um, the Gospel of John from uh, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. John 21, 1 to 19. So if you've got Bibles, you might want to find it. I'll be reading from the NRSV, so probably different to the ones you've got, but we'll make do. John 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. <coughs> Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, Why are we going fishing? They said to him, We'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast it out to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not, not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he bound some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a child on fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went to, uh, aboard, and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said, um, he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you are stretched out your hands. And someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. <coughs> Heather and Kenneth both asked me to say a little bit about um, the ministry that I'm currently involved in in Cardiff. So I shall. I, as I mentioned before, I used to be part of a church, uh, a preacher at a church called Ararat, that many of you will know. Um, there for uh, eight years, including the time I spent as a student there. But last August I left. And I left because I felt a call by God to set up uh, something new, a new faith community that I have done. And there's a, we meet now, that it's a community that meets in the Gate Art, Art Centre, if you know it, the Gate. Some of you may have been to uh, uh, various gigs or concerts or various things there. Uh, it was started by Glenwood Church, um, by a chap called Rob Lacey, who wrote the Street Bible, that some of you may be aware of. And uh, we meet there every Sunday afternoon at 4.30 over a meal. 
And the community is called Clan. Clan. Um, and it's a new monastic community. Now, I'll explain to you a little bit about that, what that actually means. A new monastic community. Basically, um, I wanted, and uh, another chap who, who started it with me, wanted to do church, do uh, a church community in such a way that actually made sense to people and was relevant to people and was there and went to people actually where they were. I was part of a community that ended sadly um, back in all, um, uh, July two years ago called Solace, which was in a, a pub church, and I did uh, finish an end. But this, this new um, expression of church is uh, an attempt really to um, build on what I learned as part of Solace. And as a new monastic community, the idea is we just want to call people into exploring who Jesus is and exploring um, where their own spiritual journey is in relation um, to what God is telling them and calling them to do. Because what we believe is that everybody, no matter who they are, what they believe, is on a spiritual journey. We all are. We all, we all have a history, we all have a past, we all have experiences, and we all have some sense of the universe and how we fit into it. Now, we believe passionately that God is speaking <coughs> into each and every individual life and saying, you want to know what it's all about? And so that's the invitation we want to give to people, is to come and join us in a community that is, is passionate about seeking what Jesus says life is all about. And we want to invite people into journeying with us as pilgrims. Now, the whole new monastic thing, just say very shortly about that. Um, the term new monastic, or uh, new monasticism, comes from a chap called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who many of you I'm sure will be aware of, um, a great martyr in the Second World War, um, pastor in the Lutheran Church, and uh, was one of the few people in Germany who actually stuck by his Christian faith and did not abandon um, the country, but said they stayed, stayed um, in that place and preached uh, the gospel, even though he was uh, threatened on many occasions uh, by Hitler and the Nazis with death, he continued to preach. And Bonhoeffer said this <coughs> in his letters, the restoration of the church will surely come only from a new type of monasticism, which has nothing in common with the old, but a complete lack of compromise in a life lived in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount, in the discipleship of Christ. I think it is time to gather people together to do this. And so we were not monks, in that we don't live together in a big abbey, and, uh, and do all that kind of stuff, but we are a community that wants to hold on to this idea of being completely uncompromising in our allegiance to the Sermon on the Mount and discovering how we can live our lives according to how Jesus told us to live our lives and how that can transform us. Because it is a journey. <coughs> the Christian life is a journey. You never arrive. It's not as though when you're baptised, you're suddenly there, You've got all sorted. It's not as though when you first make that commitment to follow Jesus, you've got all sorted. It's not as though 20, 30 years back the line, after you've been to your own teeth, um, sermon in church uh, meeting, you've got all sorted. You haven't. The Christian life is a journey. And there are ups and there are downs. And we need people to journey with us. We need to be in companionship with others as we journey together as we learn about what the Lord is saying to us at different times in our lives. Sometimes things are going well. Sometimes things really are not going well. How do we understand that as Christians? You know? How do we engage with Jesus in those times in our lives when things are really going well? These are important things, crucial things that we need to wrestle with. And actually I would argue that the church has ignored for a long time. So often, and I don't know about your fellowship here in, in, in Colby Cult, but so often um, I know that in churches we were very guilty of coming together. We, we pretend everything's okay, don't we? We come together, we, we have our Sunday smiles on our faces, and we ask each other how old they are, not really caring or wanting to know the answer, and we give them our answers. Saying, yes, I'm fine, thank you. Knowing full well things are not fine. And we come, we sing these songs of praise and triumph. Yes, God is, with God I will have the victory and with Jesus everything's going to be great and wonderful. But actually our experience is that it's not great and wonderful at all. You know, I have a confession to make. In that, um, 
the kids' talk, children's talk I just gave uh, to the children wasn't entirely true, or at least it wasn't um, a whole story. <coughs> Because scripture does say, the Apostle Paul says, that he wants to know the power of Jesus' resurrection in his own life. But at the same time, on the same verse where he says that, he also says, and I want to know the fellowship of hearing with him in his sufferings. You see, so often we want to emphasize the power, don't we, and the life and how great things are with Jesus, but we do conveniently skip over all the stuff Jesus said about suffering, about how difficult things were going to be. You know, we don't think about the, the points where Jesus said to the disciples, if you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross, deny yourself. <coughs> That's the only way to follow me. Those who want to find life have got to lose it. You've got to die to yourself. Suffering isn't just something that you can forget about, but suffering, if you want to be a Christian, suffering is part of the package. You suffer with me, Jesus says. You suffer with me. And through suffering with me and dying with me in some weird, mysterious way that we don't really understand, you will be raised with me and you will experience that power. But they come together. We don't want to talk about the other side of do the suffering side. We don't like that. It doesn't make for a good Sunday morning song, I don't think. But it's there nevertheless. And it's really um, on that note that I want to bring in the passage that we have just read. This is the post-Easter passage, and uh, a very important passage actually, because the disciples are all together after all the crazy things have happened over the previous week, all the things that they have seen and been through, every gamut of the available emotions that human beings can experience they've been through, they've had the complete death lows of going through Good Friday, they've had the painful, painstaking wait and longing and hoping and the despair of Easter Saturday, they've had the joy and the praise and, and the wonder and the awe of Easter Sunday. You know, they saw Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling scripture, and all the people praising him with palm branches. They saw that. All these amazing things, these wonderful things they've seen, and now, it's all over. All over. And they're together on a beach. Have you ever had those times in your life where like you put so much effort into something, you've been looking forward to something for so long, and you go through a period of time that's so just hectic and crazy, and, and then all of a sudden it's all over. And you have this huge kind of come down feeling, don't you? And this experience of kind of, well, what do I do with myself now? It's all done. It could be Maybe in a, a holiday, even. You know, you look forward to a holiday and you've saved for it and you've worked for it and, you, and you, you've planned it, everything, and you have this holiday and it's all over. And then it's like, oh, what do I do with myself now? And that's the place that the disciples were in in this passage. What do we do with ourselves now? You know, where are the answers? What, what do we make of any of this? You know, we, we saw Jesus die, but then, you know, we saw him. We went to the tomb and it, and it, and it was empty. And then some of, some, of the, some of the guys have actually said that Jesus appeared to them. You know, what do we make of that? Is he alive? Isn't he? You know, how do you understand that? What does it, what does it mean? If he is alive, again, what does that even mean? How do we, will we see him? How, can, how do we relate to him now? You know, who is he? He can't be a normal man. Men don't raise from the dead. What is he? Who is he? All these questions would have been buzzing around in their heads. <coughs> Such a roller coaster of emotion. And so, what do they do? Well, they do a very, very mundane thing, a very normal thing. Yeah, really, the only thing they could do is they do what they know. And Peter says, Well, guys, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to work. And then the other disciples say, Okay, well, what do you mean? And they do because, I mean, that, that, that's the temptation, that's what we want to do. When something great has happened, something really that changed our world, when something that really is shaking up our whole understanding of what we are and who we are and where we're going, after all that is over, like the temptation is to think ourselves, well, what do we do with that? Well, we just go back to life as, as usual. We'll probably forget about it here. And, you know, that's just, that's just how things are. But Jesus has got other ideas. Jesus' plan for them is not that they forget about what they've just gone through and everything they've seen and done. 
Jesus appears to them, performs this wonderful miracle <coughs> of uh, this huge miraculous catch of fish, this haul of fish, <coughs> and that instantly, they must have, when, they, when they experienced that, when they went through that, that must have taken them back to so many times that Jesus has performed these amazing miracles. I mean, just think of the, the, the feeding of 5,000, the feeding of 4,000, they must have been, that must have just been like uh, such, a, such a clue that this was Jesus, you know, it, it must be Jesus, this is Jesus' M.O., this is the kind of thing he does, this is Jesus. And all of a sudden, all those doubts and questions, they see him on the beach, and they're all answered, they're all gone, this is Jesus, he is alive. And they went out to him, and they meet him there on the beach. Jesus' plan is... To reveal to them what his resurrection means. Now they've gone through all this stuff. Now they've gone through all the bad times and the good times of the last week. What everything that's happened to them. He wants to show them now what the resurrection means for them in an ongoing sense. From now on, the rest of your life, what does it mean to say that I have risen from the dead? And he especially wants to show Peter. Because Peter's the one, isn't he? Peter's the one who. Jesus put so much stock in, has so much promise and potential. And Peter's the one who denied the Lord <coughs> and betrayed him and fled when he promised he was stand by him. Peter's the one. And what must Peter have been thinking when he saw Jesus on the beach? You know, we read in scripture, he, he was the one who jumped out of the boat and ran, to, uh, you know, across the, into the water, ran across the water to meet Jesus on the beach. But that, that was Peter's way, wasn't it? Always put his foot in it. At first, think later. But when he actually had time to think, to stop and think, what must that have been like? I haven't seen Jesus since I betrayed him. What must that have been like? And Jesus, and there's no... Um, it's, it's, it's kind of no coincidence that Jesus actually got a charcoal fire with that's what the, the, the passage says. There's a charcoal fire. Now the last time Peter was anywhere near a charcoal fire, and the same word is used, is earlier on in the gospel. He was in the chief priest's courtyard, and he was warning himself by a charcoal fire as he denied him. And betrayed him. You know that way that a smell or a sound could just transport you back to another time? You know that experience? That's what would have happened. He's, this child, the smell of that charcoal would have just reminded him again, fresh, of his denial of Jesus. What must Peter have been thinking at that moment? And so they have breakfast. And then Jesus takes Peter aside. And asks him those three questions. And Peter must have been thinking to himself, oh, here we go now. Here, here comes the, uh, here it comes. I'm going to be told now exactly what Jesus thinks of me. And he asks him these three questions, these three bizarre questions. Peter, do you love me? And asks him the same thing three times. And each time Peter says, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. When actually, again, in Peter's mind, he must have been thinking, oh, yeah, you know I'm lying. Because how can Jesus possibly think that I love him when he knows full well I denied him? But he asked him these three times. And I just think this is absolutely amazing and just demonstrates entirely what the resurrection is all about. And Jesus shows it first hand to Peter right here. Because gee, Peter denied Jesus three times. And then Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Gives him three opportunities, each one to, in a sense, counteract the, the denial that he gave earlier on. An opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I still love you. I still love you. Jesus asks this question to Peter three times. And then at the end of it, there's two wonderful words. Follow me. And again, no coincidence. The last time Peter heard those words, he was in a boat with his dad on a lake, and his chap comes wandering across the side of the water and calls out to him and says, follow me. And Peter, with all the excitement and exuberance that he has back there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, jumps out the boat, leaves Paul, his poor dad in the boat, and goes and follows him. Again, Jesus has given him another chance to saying, don't worry about those denials, don't worry, let's move past that, 
I want you to follow me. You see, in that whole episode, Jesus revealed to Peter exactly what the resurrection was about. Forgiveness, complete and utter, re-acceptance and grace. Don't worry about thinking in the past. What matters now, do you want to follow me? Because if you do, we move on from here. We move on in the journey. We're not stuck by the things of the past. We're not chained. We're not held by what we've done in the past and the mistakes that we've made. We move on. Because that is who God is. That's what our God does. That's what makes our God different to any other God, from any other religion, any other faith. And this is true. is grace. That God says, the way man, let's move on. Let's move on from here. That is what the resurrection meant to Peter. And that's what Jesus demonstrated to Peter in that moment, what the resurrection was all about. In the life of the church, an interesting period. This is an interesting time. Um, always is, every year, the time after Easter, because we've gone through the craziness of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I know you guys did. You probably had lots of celebrations here last, last Sunday. Lots of things going on. Good lots of stuff. Monday, Thursday, you probably did something for uh, Palm Sunday as well. We remember all these great things. We go back again and read up the story. Don't we do it? And we build up to it through Lent, that time of preparation and trial. Some of us will have given stuff up. I don't know if anybody here did. But we do that we're always thinking about this idea of preparation and trial and testing. And we prepare ourselves for Easter period. And it's a whole length of time that we're so focused on one thing. And all of a sudden, the Sunday after Easter, it's all over. It's all done. And we just go back to, what, life as usual? Go back to work? Go back fishing. Forget about it. Why am I saying, ladies and gents, that that is all we do? There's no point. There's no point in anything that you did last Sunday. Don't point to it. It's just a trite little ritual or a nice little thing we do, a nice little tradition. If all we do after Easter is, is come and gone, and then we don't think about these kind of things really again until, until Christmas when we have another really big build-up, then there's really no point. If, if we don't allow Easter, the Easter period, to transform us and change us, then there's really not that much point to it. It is so important to reflect on and to consider what Jesus has told you and said to you through this period. And he will have said to me, we believe in the risen living Lord, the living Jesus who speaks, who talks to us. And I guarantee you right now that you as a church, you as individuals, the season of COVID, <coughs> he will have spoken to you. He will want to speak to you. He will want to say something to you, uh, a word to transform your life, a new insight into who he is, a new insight into who you are. Have you thought about that? You know, it was on the beach. After that very first Easter that Jesus spoke to Peter and revealed to him what the resurrection meant to him, that experience of grace and mercy. What's Jesus saying to you right now? What has this Easter, 2013 years on, what has this Easter, how has this Easter transformed your life? How is Jesus wanting to speak to you through this Easter? It's such an important thing to consider. You know, one of the main things we do with the plan, um, when we meet together, it is reflection, it's reflecting, considering, always asking a question, what is God saying to me today? What is God saying to me through my experiences this week? What is God saying to me? We do this thing that we call, um, uh, it kind of sounds a bit convoluted, I know, don't forget, this is monasticism, um, it's called the Visio Divina, which is a, it sounds a bit poxy, but it's, um, it's Latin, it literally means um, a, a holy seeing, holy seeing. And the idea is we put a, a picture or something up on the, on the screen and we ask the question, what is God saying to you through this picture? And we have a time of reflection on this picture and ask the Lord to speak to us through it, through the image. Because we believe in a living God who wants to speak to us, do everything, do everything. <coughs> but only if we allow ourselves time to reflect what we hear. If we just go on to life as usual, back to work, we're not going to hear, we're going to miss it. And we're just going to carry on after every Easter as though it never happened until next year comes around and we'll do it all again. There's no point. 
But taking time to reflect, this is what it's all about. This is the time that Jesus wants to interact with us through our experiences. This is how we grow. And it's not only that, but, but as we share with each other what God has said to us, we inspire others and we help others to grow. And this is the church. This is how the church works. This is how it works. God speaks to us. We share with others. Others are inspired. God speaks to them. And they share with others. They share back to us. And, and together as a community, we continue along the road together, learning about Jesus, experiencing him, becoming a community of pilgrims, getting ever nearer to who the people that the Lord wants us to be. I'll give you an example. I, I want to give you an example of something that Jesus said to me this Easter time. Um, a new insight I've had to him that, again, this might not make, this might not, you know, move anybody here at all. Go by me, and move me, and it might move some of you, but it's about, I want to share this with you. And, um, we, we did a couple of things with Lam over, uh, over Easter. It was our first Easter together, so it was very exciting. Um, and we did a couple of things. We, on, on Monday, Thursday, we had a film screening of The Passion of the Christ. Now, you can't not be moved in some way when you watch The Passion of the Christ. Um, it is such a graphic portrayal. It's not everybody's cup of tea because some people do think it's too graphic, which is fair enough. But we showed this film, and it was in a public, it was in the bar of the, 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 the art centre, and we invited people to come and see what Morning Thursday is about. And we had communion afterwards. It was a great time together. Um, on Good Friday, we, we walked the station to the cross, which is, we, we had, there was a room that we had, and we had these different kind of pointy, different reflection stations set up, and that kind of allowed us to walk through the story of the time from the point Jesus was condemned to death to the point that he actually died on the cross. You know, there are different, different points, different things, stages along the way that you could stop at and reflect on. And we did that. And on Easter Sunday, we had a sunrise service in a, uh, a community garden in Roth, which was lovely. It's time. It was, it was very good this year because the clocks went forward. Last Sunday, as you'll remember, it was about an hour less. Back, which was lovely. And, uh, four hours sleep. Never mind. We do these kind of things, don't we? And we were there, and we, were there, we met together. It was the sun rose, and we worshipped, and we had prayer, and then we went back to one of, the, one of our um, guys' houses for, uh, for breakfast together. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. And that's what we did. I'm going to share with you a couple of things. Well, one thing in particular. I thought what God said to me. New insight He gave to me. And, um, it first struck me uh, when I was watching the, the Morning Thursday video of the Passion of the Christ. And uh, there was a scene particularly that struck me in words that struck me. I'm going to show you. Guys, we just have this on the screen. Brilliant. Okay, this is a picture of um, a, a <coughs> representation of, of the devil um, as he's tempting Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And these are the words the devil says to Jesus when he's trying to convince him not to go through with um, the great work that he did. No, no one man can carry this burden, I tell you. It is far too heavy. Saving their souls is too costly. No one. Ever. No. Never. Trying to tell Jesus that you can't do it. The burden's too great. And I started thinking, like, what was the burden that Jesus was carrying? And we talk about our sins, don't we? That Jesus took the burden for our sins. And it's true, but honestly, when you think about it, it's so much more than that. Because Jesus didn't just die for our sins. Jesus died to take upon himself all the injustice and all the evil and all the wickedness and all the stuff that isn't fair and the entire of the cosmos. Jesus took it all upon himself. All of it. So every time something unfair happens in the world, every time you are cheated out of something, that that very unfairness itself, <coughs> the concept of injustice itself, Jesus took upon himself. It was all focused on him. And those moments on the cross, evil and wickedness were all on him. Everything was on him. And that was the burden that Jesus took upon himself. Sometimes we can, we can make it too small when we think about Jesus dying for our sins. And we you know, might have a, a more or less um, deep understanding of, of our sins and how bad we think we are. But we think, oh yeah, Jesus died for my sins, wasn't it? But when you think about it, all injustice was on him. And the punishment for it all was on him. 
when tsunamis uh, you know, wipe out so many thousands and thousands of innocent people. That was on Jesus. When people say to you, how could God allow this, how could God allow that? Jesus died for that as well. Took it all upon himself. That was the burden. And, that was the, and this idea kind of hit me even more the next day on Good Friday. Guys, next slide please. Next day on Good Friday when we did the station to the cross. And uh, the final cross, the final station is Jesus dies on the cross. And we had this picture, and we practiced this Visio Divina thing, where um, we, we looked at it and, and kind of asked God to speak to us through it. And God spoke to me quite clearly, actually, and it was in conjunction with a previous thing on, on Thursday, he said. And that was, if you look, look at that image of Jesus on the cross, that might say all sorts of things to you. But for me, the thing that stood out was, look at, look at the cross section of the beam. Look how it's kind of bending. The, the bow of it, yeah? As if we've got a heavy weight on it. And again, that just hit me, struck me so strongly. The burden, the, the sheer weight of the burden of all the evil that Jesus died for was on that cross. Even to the point, you know, bending the, 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 the cross beam down. And that, just, that was an insight into Jesus and made me realise just the extent of what he did for us. On the cross.